Amen. Let's begin to find our seats this morning. Let's sing that song, Bless That Wonderful Name. And bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name. Oh, there's healing in the name. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on uprooting rejection. There's Sunday School, Sunday school for all ages except for high school Sunday School. There is none, and there is no Spanish Sunday School this morning as well. But we will open in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do this morning and what you have done and what you will do in our lives. We thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Proverbs chapter 29. That is our main verse for today. We're continuing on in our series on uprooting rejection. Probably have a few more weeks to go. Uh, we've been looking at the principle of rejection. When you uh, receive disapproval, or a lack of value from other people, and we've looked at many different ways that happens. So we're looking at this because I believe that rejection is the root of many unhealthy and destructive emotions, reactions, and decisions. And uh, I've, I've explained this through the years in pastoring, counseling people. I look at how they're acting, how they're thinking, the choices they're making, and it's like, why, where is that coming from? And often, under the surface, there is a root of rejection that has not been healed. So we've been looking at this principle, and then our answer is the truth of the Word of God. That is the antidote to rejection, and then you need a supernatural deliverance. We've been praying in each of these... Uh, sessions for that. So today we're going to look at uh, uh, one aspect, and that is rejected people often get themselves into trouble because they fear further rejection. And so today's lesson, we're going to look at rejection and the fear of rejection. One verse, Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare. Okay, let's look first of all at the fear of rejection. The enemy of our souls, he uses what is already inside of us uh, as, a, as a means of gaining entrance or to use it uh, against us. So think about two things that are inside every person. Number one, every person has an inbuilt need for acceptance. God made you that way. You need to gain approval from other people to some degree. That's uh, a, a very important principle. Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay, and that principle, of course, is talking about marriage, but... Uh, this is a very broad principle. God says you need people. People, a helper, suitable. Uh, suitable is a word, completing. Other people, they are supposed to supply something uh, that you need. Now, in a perfect world, as we said, and the world is not perfect, but in a perfect world, that would begin with loving parents, and then you would have godly relationships, and they would put or help you gain approval. You need that. That is from God. But the devil exploits that, of course, because we don't get approval. The second thing that is inside of people uh, is that anybody who's been rejected, they have negative emotions attached to whatever event of rejection uh, happened in the past. So they're, that can be with their parents, that can be with their, 
their teacher, their coach, their boss, uh, former spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, a thousand different ways. But the point is, as I've been explaining to you, rejection is not just information. It's not just data. It is not you saying, why, yes, someone gave me the message that I was worthless uh, in life. Check. That's information. It's not. It's emotional. And it, and it uh, uh, so what happens is that those events carry very deep emotional uh, uh, attachments or connections. First Samuel 13, 13, just taking one phrase out of that verse. And I, where could I take my shame? Where could I take my shame? Here is a violation. She is rejected and turned away. And so she says, that's not just information. I carry shame attached to that. We did a whole lesson, Psalm 109, uh, 109 verse 22. For I am poor and needy. And my heart is wounded within me. Okay, my heart is wounded. This is the, uh, the real truth of life is people that have unhealed wounds on the inside. That is, and a rejection is one of those wounds. If you don't get that healed, then of course it carries an ongoing effect. Okay, so because you need acceptance and because past rejection has emotional pain, so what is released in people's lives is a spirit of fear. They fear rejection because we don't ever want to feel like that again. We don't ever want to be in that uh, position again. So whether the emotion for you is pain whether it was embarrassment, helplessness, shame, worthlessness, confusion, those are emotions that are no fun. So it is normal, normal people want to avoid pain, right? Sick people like pain. If there's something you enjoy people treating you badly, seek professional help. You, that's, that's a deeper issue. It is normal in life when there is something painful. I want to keep away from it. I don't like that feeling. I don't ever want to feel like that uh, again. So, because rejection most often came from people. It can be events, you know, failure produces it. But most often rejection comes from people so now what happens is the focus of our fear of rejection is on people. So we make this connection. People made me feel worthless, hurt me, uh, not loved, whatever. So now we make people the focus of our life. I want people to accept me. There, there are people, they are driven I want you to accept me or I don't want you to reject me. So the real issue is there, what happens is we can become afraid of people. We live in fear. We fear that they will not accept us. We fear that they will reject us. So we have a fear of rejection. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So the fear of man, this is not talking about, you know, I saw a uh, uh, you know, big biker in a dark alley. You know, I was afraid of man. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about in the ordinary course of life. In your relationships, in your family, at school, on the job, wherever you come in contact with people, there are people, they live with a fear of man, and this is not gender specific, a fear of people. And the reason why they fear is I do not want people to reject me and make me feel 
like I uh, felt before. So, the fear of man is, number one, we fear what other people think of us. There's some of you, they are obsessed with, right now, what, what do people think of me? A fear of man. I, I fear what they think. We fear what people will say to us. That'd be number two, or, or do. Say or do. So I don't want them to say anything that is rejecting. I don't want them to do something. I don't want them to cut me off or or uh, embarrass me in any way. So we fear what they'll say or do. And then, of course, the reverse could be we fear what they will not say or they will not do. So this is where many people live. Fear of man, fear of rejection causes us then, our focus is, I want to please people. All of my decisions... All of my actions are based on this. I want you to accept me. Because if you accept me, I'm never going to feel like that. So, what happens in rejected people is sometimes we try to live our life to please people. It's not what do I want. It's not what does God want. What do you want? Okay, I'll do whatever you say because I want you to accept me. I want you to be happy with me. So think about how the fear of rejection manifests and none of these are good. So fear of rejection can cause us to violate our conscience. Conscience is self-testimony. There is a voice inside. If you, if you help a little old lady across the street, if you do a good deed for someone, you feel good inside because there's an inner voice that says, that was good, you helped, you're a nice person. But when you know what is right and you do wrong, there's an inner voice. That's why people feel guilty, they feel bad. It's an inner voice. So God has created people with conscience there is an inbuilt of course if you were raised uh, uh, under the teaching of the word of God or you're raised with godly principles of course that is more uh, acute but most people have a sense of conscience people who don't have conscience we call them psychopaths or sociopaths the mark of a sociopath or a psychopath, they're interchangeable, is people who don't feel. They don't care. That's, you become a serial killer. I don't care. So most people have a sense of right and wrong, whether that is social, but especially for us, I'm teaching, I'm assuming that primarily the vast majority of the people here are Christians. We know what God wants. Okay, when you fear other people, one of the ugly things it produces is you will violate your conscience. You will go against what you know is right. Why? To please people. Classic story in the Bible is uh, Pilate, John 19. This is the crucifixion of Jesus. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Okay, so Pilate is not a Christian. And yet he has a sense of right and wrong. A, a crowd, a mob shows up one day. They bring this man that he doesn't know. Jesus, and they say, we want you to execute this man. And so he begins to inquire about this, and he realizes this man has done nothing that deserves the death penalty. But they're like, no, we want him to die. So the Bible says he sought to release him. He knew it would be right. Jesus has done nothing wrong, so legally I should... 
I should let him go. And he said, no, no, I'm going to let him go. But they started a mob riot. They started shouting at him. There's great pressure. If you let him go, you're no friend to Caesar. So here are the opinions of people. Here's consequences. We're going to tell your boss. We're going to get you in trouble. And so because of that, what does he do? Judge him. Put him to death, knowing that that was not right. Okay, that's an ancient story, but part of the reason why that story is in the Bible is we're a lot like Pilate. If you have rejection that you have not uh, uh, dealt with, there's a very good chance at some point you are going to do things you know are not right. You're going to go along with the crowd. So, we violate our conscience. Secondly, of course, fear of rejection can cause us to make wrong decisions even to the point of sin. 1 Samuel 15, 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Okay. I sinned. Now, and of course, this is blame, which we looked at, I think, last week. But this is classic. I sinned. Why? I feared people. I feared what they would think, what they would say, what they would do, what they would not do. So because of that, I did what I knew was wrong. I sinned. That, that's human nature. How many of you here, you smoked in the past? Like an hour ago. No. I, <laughs> there is no one here that the first time you smoked a cigarette, you said, wow, that is, that tastes wonderful. <laughs> you gag, you choke. Some of you, you threw up, but probably there were other people around. Right? Come on. People, they, they drink, they take drugs, and it's rare for people to begin habits alone. Most often, they start bad habits with other people. Why? Because everybody else is saying, here, try this, do this. I, I don't want you to raise your hand. There are people that are here. You slept with people you didn't want to. Because you feared they'll dump me. They'll make fun of me. Literally sin, why? Because I want to please you. I want to please people. People steal People commit crimes because they fear people. Third thing is fear of rejection can cause us to deny God. Matthew 10, 33. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, this is... Uh, classic Jesus is actually speaking to people who are followers and he warns them he says make sure that you don't deny me before people because this is what people with rejection issues they don't hit they fear rejection are you one of those bible thumpers holy rollers no do you go to that church uh, only because they make me. <laughs> right? There are people here, you will not witness. You have friends, you have family, you know they're going to hell, you're not going to open your mouth. Because you are afraid that someone will not accept you, they will reject you, you fear what they think, you fear what they say, you fear what they won't say or what they won't do. On and on, fear of rejection causes people to deny God. Fourthly, fear of rejection causes people to be, uh, or, or causes them to be unable to be honest. 
As a pastor, I get people that they come and seek help. They seek counseling, which is good. The problem is there are people that they come after the explosion. Or they come to me at 11.59 and 59 seconds. When the marriage is on the cliff. And, and all, <laughs> How long has this been going on? 29 years. And you just came now. Right? It, it, it's now to the point of losing your job, losing your marriage, losing your ministry, losing your salvation. Why didn't you ask? I'm, I'm happy to try to help. But why didn't... This has been going on for years. Why didn't you ask for help before? Fear of rejection. Because somewhere in their past, someone rejected them, and especially if this was performance-based, how could you not be? How could... And so that's what they think. They have this intense fear. Someone who could help them, I'm not asking for help because I am afraid. What if they look at me and go, what kind of... Listen, I hear everything. You're not going to tell me anything that's going to shock me. Pro I promise you. But, but we think our pro there are other people go, oh, that's a fear of rejection. So you would, does it make sense to live in misery and not get help? Simply because you're afraid of what? No, that doesn't, does it make sense to get to the point of destruction? That doesn't make sense. And yet fear of rejection causes us to be unable to ask for help. Sometimes people even lie about their sin. They cover up. They're doing wrong. It's killing them. It's ruining their salvation, ruining their relationships, ruining their marriage. But they won't be honest and say, I need help. I'm in trouble. Because they fear embarrassment, they fear, you know, loss of ministry or whatever it is. So they would rather be destroyed. That is the fear of man. That's not healthy. Very, very destructive. Last thing, the fear of rejection causes people to be unable to say no. How many of you here speak English? Okay, one of the most powerful words you need in life is no. Say it, no. Some of you, you never say no. And that's the problem. You feel guilty. You are afraid. So people come. Some of you here, it's causing you problems in your finances. You can't say no. People come, yeah. You're a soft touch. Listen, I'm going to tell you, people who are money grubbers, they're master psychologists. They can look in a crowd. I've even read books on sociopath. Sociopath have a demonic ability. They can look at a crowd, and in a second, they know who's an easy touch. Do you know that? They know who can't say no. So this is the problem. There are people here who's like, you know, you know you can't afford it. You know they're going to use it for ungodly purposes, but you can't say no. Why? Because you fear. Listen, you f some of you, you fear what a derelict thinks about you? You fear what a scammer, what an addict thinks about you? <laughs> some of you can't say no. Request for help. This is, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I teach people even in the things of God. You know, there's only so many hours in the week. You can't help every person that needs help with everything. Can you help me rebuild my transmission? And help me move? And you can't say yes to every ministry? There's only so many hours in the day. You can't be involved in every ministry in the church. Some people say, Pastor, I'm so stressed out, I can't, my, you know, my wife is about to kill me. Why? Because you're in 97 ministries. Why? You can't say no. 
It, it, this is math. It's not hard. Uh, how many hours in the week? How many nights free? No, that's not going to work. And some people, they can't do that. Some of you are easy touches. I, I must confess at times I know people. I wish I was a salesman because there's some of you I'd make a lot of money off you. Because <laughs> you can't say no. Salesman talks to you and, goes, and it's a great deal. You've got to sign up. It's only going to be, you're going to pay it off in 147 years. You go, okay. You don't want to. You can't afford it, but you can't say no. Why? Because the fear of man. And it's connected to somebody in the past who rejected you and you feel bad from that and it's not healed. So the Bible says this is the fear of man. Pete wants to say something. There, you there go. was a study years ago where they put a bunch of kids in a classroom, about teenage, um, and one of them was, a, was set up, and they put lines on the board, and they said, which line is longer? And all the kids chose the short one, and the kid who was the set up, he chose the short one too, knowing, he said later, I, I knew that it was not the long one, but everybody else said it was the and, and he and, yeah. and they did this over and over and over again, and it was like a, a, a horrendous high percentage of yeah. people who did chose the wrong thing just because of peer pressure. <laughs> That's right. That is human nature that gets on people. Okay, let's talk about a second thing. Then I'm going to open up for some more comments in a moment. So let's talk about the damage of the fear of rejection. In our text, it says the fear of rejection or the fear of man, rather is a trap. Let's read that again. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a <clears throat> snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay, so, if you fear what other people think, say, do to you, the Bible says you become snared or trapped. So, an animal that is trapped, their life is determined by the one who trapped them. So, in life, in whatever area of life, your entire life is determined by other people. The course of your life. There are people sitting in jail right now because they couldn't say no, went against their conscience. So their life is determined by other people. Financially, I, I pastored in South Africa, intense poverty. So these are people who are struggling barely to survive. But one of their family members says... Uh, we all have to, you know, uh, send us. You, you got to send me 5,000 rand. And so they come, they be tormented. They don't want to do this. They can't afford. They're barely eating. But, but so your financial future is going to be determined by other people. Your, your relationship with God, eternity. So you become trapped and then, of course, the idea here is the fear of man. If you are snared, you're stuck. For some of you, this is why you don't move on in life. You don't move on in relationships. You don't move on in your walk with God. You don't move on in your finances because you're stuck. Always comes back, I can't move on. What do I do in life? What other people want me to do? because I'm afraid that they will reject me. Look at some of the damage that's done by the fear of rejection. So, people who live with the fear of man, they're most often unhappy. They're not happy in life because they are constantly making decisions that they didn't really want to make. 
They buy stuff, they get it home, and then they resent, why did I buy this stupid thing? I don't even like it because the salesman pressured you. My finances, why did I give that person that? I didn't want to give them money. I didn't want to do that. Again, you violate your conscience. You go against it. So, if you live with the fear of man, which is really the fear of rejection, I predict there are areas of your life that you are very unhappy about. Number two is people that live with the fear of man, they're often guilty because they do things they know are wrong. I predict there are people probably that are sitting in Sunday school right now, they'll be in church this morning, you are not going to feel good during the service because during the week you made decisions you knew were not right. Probably because somebody else was involved. So now you live with guilt. This is the problem with coming to church. For, for guilty people, one of their torments is, I'm going to walk past and the pastor is going to look me in the eye. And of course their concern is that maybe God will be telling them like, oh, we need to talk. Right? This is a problem. You're in the presence of God. Let's, let's sing. Worship is like, mm, I shouldn't have done that. The fear of man makes you guilty. So the, this is the problem, denying God. People who live with the fear of man, they don't fit in with the unsaved people. They're not truly like them. And they don't fit in with the saved people. So, because they live with guilt, I did what I know is wrong. Third thing, we struggle in relationships and have relationship problems. If you don't know that word that I taught you, two letters, no. You're, you're going to need it in lots of different ways. Some of the people you need to say no to, they're evil. Right? They're wanting you to sin. The answer should be no. That's a no-brainer. But you have people that you're related to. You might even have people that you go to church with. And they, they pressure you to go along with what they want. And because you can't say no, you say yes and you didn't want to. So now what happens to people who say yes when they should have said no? They resent those people. So now there's conflict. They don't get along well, right? This is the problem. If you sleep with someone because they pressure you, I promise you, you will hate them. This is the foolishness of people who sleep together before they're married, and then they think marriage fixes it. It doesn't. Is it manifest? You pre Even though you participated, you wind up hating them. And this causes marriage difficulties. There are people that you are tormented, you avoid people. You come in church, you walk on the other side. I don't want to see them because I know they're going to ask me to help. I know they're going to ask for money. I know they... That's a miserable way to live. Because you can't say no, so now there's relationship conflict. So either there's distance, like, what's the problem? Why don't you ever come around anymore? And you can't be honest and just say, because I don't want to do what you said. No. So, so now there's this distance, there's this funky, the family feeling. Thanksgiving's a real treat for some people, isn't it? <laughs> or then there's literal conflict. There are people they hate. They, they, they hate people because, and how they think of it, you pressured me, you pushed me, you asked, you would... But the real issue is you wouldn't say no. And so now you have relationship conflicts. You, this is part of the problem is that you have to, and this is true in every human relationship. Some of you have come to me and you've explained the dynamics of your family, your friendship, even your marriage. And, 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 and I've given you, so have you ever talked to them about it? No. We can't talk about that. 
then you're going to be miserable. That, that's part of a healthy... I did a whole series on this about in conflict, right? Is you have to. You can't have healthy relationships unless you can be honest. You know what? When you say that to me, uh, that really bothers me. That's not working for me. When you push and you want me, that's not going to work. You have to if you're going to have healthy relationships. And then, of, of course, the final thing is we, the damage is that we literally become involved in sin. So, people who go against their conscience and they sin, they damage, first of all, their relationship with God. And that is actually the most important relationship that you have. Matthew 10, 33. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so this is basic. If at school this past week you were denying Jesus, if to your family, your workmates, you're denying Jesus, but you have real needs. So now you're praying and you're saying, oh God, I need you to help me, I need you to... But th this is common sense, right? God says you're dissing me, and, but now you want my help. You want my blessing, but you won't even stand up for me? That, that doesn't make common sense, does it? What you have to face is pleasing people is actually idolatry. Read in the Old Testament all that about idols, right? You, you look at our church, we don't have any idols, there's no pictures, holy pictures, statues, candles. We're, we're not Indian. We don't have gods in the house. So you, you ever read the Old Testament, all this about you have no other gods before me? Right? Let, let's read that verse. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so for us, I, I don't have any gods. I don't have you know, Shiva or Buddha or you know, anything else at home. Right? I'm not wearing any amulets or any, anything. But some of you, if you care more about what your friends think, what unsaved people think, what your family thinks, than God, an idol is the one you love the most and who you want to please the most. So when God says, you'll have no other gods, some of you were idol worshiping this week. You went to school with them. And what you're saying is, I care more about what you think. I bow down to your opinion, your unsaved family. I want you to be happy with me more than almighty God. And God says, absolutely not. That's not right. And so then, of course, the ultimate is you can lose your soul because of the fear of man. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay, so you fear people because of what they can do to you. When I got saved, I told my friends, I'm not going to be partying with you anymore. And I knew what was coming. They mocked me. They made sure when the halls were crowded. Hallelujah, Mitchell. Here comes the Jesus freak. So I wasn't happy about that. I didn't want them to do that. But I made up my mind. It's like, I like you, but not enough to go to hell for you. Right? Some of you, you got a boy, you got a girl. Listen, they may be good looking. They're not so good looking they're worth burning in hell for. <laughs> so therefore, why would you lose your... There are people in hell right now. Think about that. While we're teaching, there are people burning in hell. What was one of the things that sent them to hell? They cared more about people than what God thought. And God said, the one you should be afraid of is not your classmate, your schoolmate, your cousin. It's almighty God. So this is the, the, the problem that we have. Okay, let's open for some comments or questions. Over the back there, I can't see who it is, but give that to them, give them a microphone. Uh, 
I was wondering about um, Saul. You had a thing about Saul there. And he was so worried about what the people were thinking that he uh, disobeyed God. But he, it, uh, it, it seems to me that rejection is not a static thing. It, it has the ability to grow because he, he started off with fear and then he became like paranoid yeah. of what God was doing and, and especially David. And uh, he eventually ended up killing the priest of Nob. In other words, he came to the point of where he didn't care even what the people thought because they didn't want to kill the priest, but, but he did because he was so paranoid and just kind of went over the edge. Yes, and that's fear of rejection. Yes, it does grow. And the reason why is you start making bad decisions and then bad decisions multiply and they grow. Uh, bear. I remember a long time ago in, the, in, the, in our church, if Pastor Wayman Mitchell used to say off and on that rejection is a big devil, you know, tall, big, strong. And then at other times, uh, I remember him saying when he was praying for people, either for healing or for something along those lines, he would say, uh, do you reject I want you to say, I reject rejection, right. or I cast out rejection, and, and the fear of rejection. Yep. And it took, he, and he said that often enough that I, I tried to understand it, but a lot of it is, is <clears throat> what you're teaching with a, with a different angle. Yes, and so one is fear. Some of you have, literally, you have physical problems. You are knotted up on the inside. Right? There are people, they have, they have digestive problems, for instance. They have, because they are knotted up on the inside because they're terrified of what people said about them. So they can think back to the event, someone said something and made you feel rejected and you, it's been eating up, uh, eating you up on the inside. That's, that's kind of one way. Then, then uh, you know, these... Uh, these things open the door. That's what rejection does. You let it in in fear, it opens the door to that. So, yes, it literally does produce sickness. That would be a whole thing we could uh, add to it. So there's nothing good that comes from fearing people. Right? There's no healthy advantages. But uh, generally, and you know, unless you're a child who needs a spanking, you should fear your parents, I guess. But that would be a different, different lesson here. Sister? I have a tale to tell about myself. <laughs> uh, when Vic and I had started, we were, had started Cucamonga Church, and he was taking classes at, at Life Bible College. And so I decided to audit a class. And I don't know why, but this class was about a cleansing. The whole class was about a, a colon cleanse. So at the end, uh, yeah, I'm 10 years older than all the other ki uh, kids there. At the end, they, they asked for anybody who wanted to ask questions. Well, nobody raised their hand. And I, I was looking around, and I knew with, beyond a shadow of doubt, every single one of them had two questions to ask. So I raised my hand, which was not allowed. I was auditing. Anyway, they allowed me to, and I said, I've got two questions. One, how much does it cost? And two, does it hurt? Everybody just roared. You know, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were wanting to ask that question, yeah. but were ashamed to. And I felt so liberated inside because even though they were laughing partly at me, but partly at themselves and the, quest, the answer, the question that I had. But I felt, you know how you said it, fear binds you and fear people, you, yeah. you feel bound and, and, and trapped and, and all that that uh, for, for that short length of time, all of that left, I felt totally liberated for the first time. It was great. Yeah, and, and fear makes things bigger, right? The word fear means to feel small. So this is the problem. We have people in our life, they're 90 feet tall in our lives, right? And, and that's why I said, about, have you ever told them? You ever had a discussion? And some people, they discover that having a discussion, no one died, right? Should have had that conversation a long time ago. So, okay, let's talk finally about healing. 
the fear of rejection. If, if, if fear of man is a trap, you need to free yourself from the trap or get freed from the fear of rejection. So how do you get free from the fear of rejection? I, I think, of course, why I'm doing this class is you need to be healed of the wounds. It is not going to do any good for me to tell you be strong and make a stand. If the root, that's why the whole series, uprooting, if you have a root, you, if you have wounds from the past that have caused you to fear people, it don't matter how many times I say, make a stand, be strong, but the problem is you've never dealt with the root. Every single time, it's gonna be a torment. The answer is to get the wounds healed. Okay, Luke 4.18 gives us that promise. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Okay, I want you to notice the order. First of all, the Spirit of the Lord. So, we need something supernatural. That's the reason why I'm teaching this. I am not teaching you psychology. I am interested in a miracle. The Spirit of the Lord, he anointed me to preach. Gospel is good news. So let's talk about the second and the third promises here. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What comes after healing? Liberty to the captives. So in the order there, healing comes before freedom. You can't get free unless you are healed. That's why I say, for me to say, just make a stand and say no, it won't help if you don't let God heal the wounds. Some of you have deep emotional wounds that are caused by rejections. You need a healing, first of all. Number two, you won't get free unless you repent of idolatry. Because if you fear people, you are idolizing them. You are worshiping their opinion more than God. Genesis 35, verse 2. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purif purify yourselves and change your garments. Okay, this is God who said, I want you to go back to Bethel where I first met you. I want to have a close relationship with you. And Jacob wisely says to the family, okay, put away all other gods, foreign gods or gods that are not the living God. We need to deal with our gods if we want to have close relationship with the living God. He says that comes first. And that's true. Some of you, your friend, your family, Whoever it is that you fear their opinion, you've made them a God. And I'm sorry, that's sinful. You need to repent and say there is no God above Almighty God. God, I'm sorry, that's wrong that I worship their opinion more than you. Lastly is you need to trust God. Go back to our verse, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay, the fear of men brings a snare. That's what we've been concentrating. That's the trap. So what is the answer? Whoever trusts in the Lord. You have to trust God if you're going to serve him. So part of that is healing rejection is you have to trust God's opinion of your worth. Right? People in the past may have said, you are worthless, you're no good, you don't measure up. But that's not what God says. God has a different opinion. So I trust God's opinion more than people. And if I trust God's opinion, I trust that my future, my life is in God's hands. That's why I don't have to go against my conscience to make you happy. Because my life is in God's hands. Daniel 3, 17 and 18. 
If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Okay, so they said, I know what you want us to do. I know you're threatening us if we don't do it. But listen, I'm trusting in God. God is able to deliver. Our future is in God's hands, it's not in your hands. And you need to learn that to, in, in life. So if we do that, if we get healed from rejection, if we repent of idolatry and we trust God, what God does is he goes to work. He wants to help us. Proverbs 20, 29, 25, last time. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay, so safety comes from trusting in the Lord instead of fearing people, right? I, I'm safe from making bad decisions. I'm, I'm safe from buying stuff that I can't afford and didn't want in the first place. I'm safe from sin in some ways. So it... it, it it means God is able to help you. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, we looked at the denying before, but now look at the confessing. This, of course, is partly in eternity. God will uh, speak up for you, but this is now. Some of you, you really need help in your life. You need God, you need miracles. And so this is connected to prayer. Is if you confess me before men, if you stand for, no, I'm not gonna go along with that sinful idea. No, I'm not going along to please people. That pleases God. No, God is most important, right? That works out in a hundred different ways. When you stand for God, he says, I will speak up for you. But that's practical. God helps you, and one of those is in prayer. Final thought, Daniel 3, 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Okay, so this is what happens. Anytime people say no to people pressure and they put God first, God shows up. That's, isn't that what you need? You need God to show up in your life, your family, your marriage, your finances, in every area of life. That happens because God is pleased when people choose what's right. Let's bow our heads. Amen. This is something that is very practical. And we are going to pray. Some of you I know in different areas, the fear of rejection is what you battle with. You struggle. I'm going to help you to pray. I want you to say this out loud. Say, Father God, I recognize I have feared the opinions of people. And I have valued their opinion more than you. That is wrong. And I repent. I am asking you, heal the wounds from the past that have come from rejection. Set me free from those emotions, that fear. I cast it out. Strengthen me and enable me to make right decisions. And I thank you for healing, for deliverance, for freedom, and the blessing you're going to bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank God right now. Father God, oh God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, God, I am so grateful that you love us. Praise God. There are some of you, while I was praying, that uh, like we talked about sickness, some of you is from rejection, from a conflict. It's been eating you up. You're, you're going to discover that God touched you while we prayed. 
is a side of it. We weren't praying for healing, and you're going to discover God healed you anyway. Thank God. God bless you. Service will start at 1030.